natural resources. You want to talk about it? Yeah, so um, the Grand Ronde has uh, a little bit of education that they're trying to do about like forest uh, protection and natural resource protection. And uh, I shared a link about just what they're doing in their area, but like it's one of those things where, you know, listening to indigenous people that have stewarded this land for years, like generations well beyond you know like our modern governmental system of management of the lands these are the people to go to to really understand the right way of doing forest management so figured i'd share it this is a book that i was mentioning and i think that it ties in actually a lot within the indigenous mindset where you're not separate from nature um, and so I really highly, this book is really, really great read. Talking about books too, we've mentioned Jeff Golden, a state senator from Ashland several times. He wrote a wonderful book called Forest Blood, oh, about 20 years ago. And it, it really talks about the culture of, of small woods, towns in Southern Oregon uh, that at one time had small mills and a lot of the uh, smaller landowners were cutting their their uh, wooded acreages on a more sustainable basis. And it, it talks about the kind of the collapse of that culture and lifestyle as uh, larger timber uh, concerns came in and bought up a lot of acreages and, and uh, in order to pay off their loans and for other reasons, uh, profit driven. Uh, engaged in a lot more clear cutting and then that really set up uh, or continued the the boom and bust that uh, uh, large-scale commercial industrial uh, logging creates anyway it's 2 30 i think we should start and i have been writing out an introduction for bob salinger uh, bob is a uh, associated with uh, portland audubon He's gonna have a, what I consider a marvelous PowerPoint presentation on Oregon State University's uh, proposal for the Elliott State Research Forest. Um, this is a proposal which the State Land Board will, will hear. I don't know whether they're actually gonna to vote to accept it or they're gonna vote at least to, to, to move it on uh, on December 8th. And that's a Zoom meeting. And that Zoom meeting is referred to in our uh, pacificgreens.org website. Um, Bob and Audubon have, I think, about a 30-year history with uh, the Oregon State Land Department's management of the Elliott and many other forest issues, and I think he's going to tell us a good bit about it. So, Bob, if you're ready, we're ready. You will need to unmute yourself. Um, Bob? He was here yeah. a minute ago. There he yeah. is. Okay, All right. great. All right, can you all see the screen? We yes, can. Yes. yes. All right. Let me just go. Can you still see it? We can see half of it. The other half is kind of black, blackish. All right, let me see if we can pull that forward. There. There we go. Sorry, just Perfect. trying to get any PowerPoint display here. There we go. Mm -hmm. All thank right, you. hey, so, so thank you all for uh, having me today. I'm gonna go through a quick PowerPoint of uh, my, my perspective on the Elliott State Forest Plan. I've been uh, part of the advisory committee for the last couple of years. I've worked for Portland Audubon for about 30 years, uh, including a lot of work on forest issues in the Elliott. I'm gonna try to get through a pretty pick, quick presentation in, in about 15 minutes that's gonna give you a little bit of history and then an overview of the plan and, and why we're supporting moving it forward uh, <coughs> in front of the land board on, on Tuesday. Um, and the question that's before us really at the macro level is should the Elliott State Forest be converted into an Oregon State University research forest? 
On Tuesday, they're just voting to forward it into the next phase. We still have about a year and a half to two years of work to do, but this is a check-in to say that, yeah, the work that's been done to date, which is sub substantial, is the direction that the state wants to go. It will facilitate a lot more investment in this process. The next phase is very expensive. So this is the big moment in terms of whether this plan goes forward or not, but it's not the end. For those of you that aren't familiar with the Elliott, it's an 82,000 acre forest uh, near, near in Coos Bay and Reedsport. Um, it's an amazing place. It's a stronghold for federally listed marble merlets and coho salmon, has some of the best uh, salmon bearing streams in the coast range. Um, it's been heavily logged. Uh, about 50% of it has been logged and 50% of it is older forest. Um, and when I say older, uh, most of that is under about 152 years because of a big stand replacement fire in 1868. Um, it's also part of the Common School Fund. And what that means is that the revenue from this forest goes to funding schools. And that's a statutory requirement. So that's been in place and that's driven a lot of the uh, management of the Elliott over the years. And it's a, it's a real fundamental problem. The Elliott had years and years of uh, illegal clear cutting of older forests. Um, in 2012, uh, Portland Audubon Center for Biological Diversity and Cascadia Wildlands, and I give a tremendous amount of credit here specifically to Cascadia Wildlands, uh, brought a lawsuit. At that time, they were cutting uh, upwards of 500 plus acres of older forest a year. Uh, they were aiming for 25 million board feet, but in the year that we brought the lawsuit, they were trying to increase to 40 million board feet. Uh, so we were gonna see, we were seeing a lot of cutting of old, older forest, uh, a lot of cutting of marble merlet habitat, and we were uh, being told there was gonna be a massive expansion of that work. Uh, the three groups brought a big lawsuit in 2012 in 2014, uh, Oregon settled that lawsuit and terminated 28 timber sales. And it basically shut down logging on the forest. They had to use different protocols um, and they had to re reconfigure what they were going to do next. Um, logging, logging was going to come back, but it was gonna look different. Um, rather than figuring out how to go forward, the state instead decided to sell 1,100 acres of the forest very, very quickly at a fire sale. They sold it to two timber companies, and then they put the entire forest up for sale. Uh, basically, they said, if we can't cut it, we will give it to somebody who can. And uh, if we can't cut the levels we want to, we'll sell it off and get the money for the common school fund. They appraised it at $220.8 million, uh, and that was the sale price. There was a huge battle. Uh, two more lawsuits were brought by those three organizations, Portland Audubon, Cascadia Wildlands, and Center for Biological Diversity. Uh, one of them is still in play. One of them we have won. Those were challenging the, uh, the uh, fire sale of 1,100 acres. Um, and then there was a two-year battle in front of the land board. And this forest is managed by the land board, uh, the governor, the treasurer, and the secretary of state to keep the forest from being sold. Uh, basically, the argument being this is a public forest, it ought to uh, remain in public ownership. And it was a, a fairly, for those of you that were involved, a, a very difficult fight. Um, in 2017, the land board uh, decided that they would keep it in public ownership. Uh, we and others also lobbied for a bill in the Oregon legislature to get $100 million in bonding to decouple the Elliott from the Common School Fund. And I think the uh, position of, of conservation groups that have been, wor been working on this for years is, is pretty much unanimous that until we separate the Elliott from funding schools directly, that this anarch uh, anachronistic way of funding schools needs to go away, there will continue to be pressure to up the cut. In 2018, the land board voted to pursue transferring the Elliott State Forest to Oregon State University as a research forest. And they put together uh, some terms for the transfer, those included keeping the public far, pu forest publicly owned, keeping public access, decoupling from the school fund and compensating the school fund. Remember, we have $100 million bonded for it, but we need another 120.8 to do it completely. Continuing habitat protection for uh, the forest and for species, allowing for harvest and providing multiple other benefits as well. They put together a stakeholder advisory committee. Uh, you can see who was on it here. There were three tribal representatives, three conservation representatives, uh, 
two counties, um, timber interests, recreational interests. Uh, I'll, I'll hit a couple of things I think you're going to hear from other people later. Uh, you know, people I've heard say that, you know, they don't trust uh, OSU to manage the forest. Remember that the state had to be sued three times on this thing, tried to sell it. Um, when I think about who I trust, I don't trust anybody. What I need for whatever agreement we ultimately reach is enforcement mechanisms that give me confidence that whatever we agree to can be enforced. And that will be with the state or with OSU. I've also heard some people suggest that the advisory committee was inappropriate because the counties were on there or timber interests were on there. I don't feel that it was inappropriate. I actually think it was a very good advisory committee. I think it worked very hard. I was actually impressed with the advisory committee. And I've never been on a stakeholder advisory committee that was made up of just one perspective. The purpose of a stakeholder advisory committee is to get a variety of perspectives together and see uh, if they can find common ground or at least daylight their issues. So I actually don't have a problem with the advisory committee. I think it was actually a pretty impressive group that worked extremely hard for two years. I've been on a lot of these. I thought this one was one of the better, better ones I've been on. So let's get to the proposal because I know we're short on time. Uh, remember, this is an 82,000 acre forest. About half of it has been logged. About half of it is under 65 years. The rest of it is primarily between 65 and 152 years. Most of that is between 100 and 152. What is being proposed is that the forest will be divided up into basically a large conservation area and then research watersheds. The red on this screen, uh, the eastern portion of the forest, or the, I'm sorry, the western far portion of the forest, will be a 35,000 acre contiguous forest preserve. Um, there'll be some uh, timber harvest early on to basically get some of the plantations that are in there back into ecological shape, but those will be done, those will be restoration harvests. They won't be uh, really revenue generating harvests. But ultimately, we will have a 35,000 acre, slightly less permanent contiguous reserve. That will be the largest reserve in the Oregon Coast Range. Um, it is bigger than Devil's Staircase immediately to the north. So it is, it is a big reserve. Um, the rest of the forest will be divided into management watersheds. And those will include uh, about 14,000 acres of clear cuts, about 14,000 acres of extensive forestry, uh, which really means selective harvest. Uh, and then uh, smaller reserves, the dark green scattered throughout the rest of this uh, sort of multicolored chart are small permanent reserves. So we're getting a very big reserve, a lot of smaller reserves, and then a mixture of selective harvest and clear cutting. I don't like clear cutting. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be very blunt about that. And I don't like cutting any of any older forest either. That That is not... Uh, consistent with the ideal world that I would like to see, but I am supporting this. Um, total, just so folks can get the numbers, about 66% of the forest will be in permanent reserves. That's about 54,000 out of the 82,000 acres. About 14,000 acres or 17% will be in selective har harvest, anywhere from 20 to 80% retention. And then about 17%, about 14,000 acres will be in clear cuts. All of the clear cuts, 100% of those clear cuts will be in plantations. So those are areas that have previously been clear cut and are under 65 years of age. Why am I supporting this? Uh, shouldn't we protect the whole thing as a carbon reserve? Ab absolutely, in my ideal world, we would do that, but I don't think we're going to get there. Um, and I've worked on this for a long time. Francis is on the phone, has worked on it a lot longer. Um, but uh, I believe that this is our best option going forward. And I think it's a pretty good option actually. Um, I'm actually proud of what we have here. And there are some, some sacrifices, but I think overall, what I would tell people is we are getting more than 90% of the older forests permanently protected either in the very large preserve or in the smaller reserves. Actually 93% of forests over 65 years in this forest will be permanently protected. In 50 years, 73% of the forest will be mature or old growth over a hundred years and a lot of it close to 200 years compared to 49% today. So we are going to see a forest that is going to age dramatically. We'll see far more older forest over time, and we will see far less fragmentation over time. So we're gonna get a much, much healthier forest. 
Uh, we got relatively strong stream protections. Those are still a work in progress. Um, we've gotten rid of uh, spraying in any reserves, limited ground spraying in the selective harvest areas and aerial spraying only uh, when there are no other alternatives in the, um, the clear cuts. Uh, again, you know, I'd love to see no spraying, but uh, we, we've made a lot of progress here. No use of poisons for wildlife control activities. The last strength I want to highlight for you is that, you know, this has buy-in for most of the groups, Douglas County, Bale, they, they, but the rest of the groups are supporting it strongly, including the tribes. And, uh, you know, I think uh, as somebody that's fought on these issues for a long time, I think the hope is always that you can get something that is truly ecologically responsible and also that brings people together. And I think we will need this kind of coalition to get us beyond the common school fund issues as well. Uh, so I see this as potentially not just doing a, a, a good job of protecting the forest much better than what we've had historically, but also bringing folks together that have been historically at odds. I think that is a positive. I'm going to skip this slide and this one. I'll just say that, again, a much older forest, a much less fragmented forest and protection of 90% of 93% of the older forests that currently exist. What are we giving up? in this because there are some compromises too. Uh, the first is that OSU has insisted that about 3,200 acres of older forest between 65 and 152 years be included in selective harvest. None of that will be clear cut. I wanna emphasize that because there's been a lot of misinformation put out there and I've seen people put out that they're gonna clear cut old growth forests. That is false. Uh, and one group has withdrawn an action alert that they, that said that because they realized that it was wrong. But there will be some selective harvest in older forests. I don't agree with that, but I'm willing to, to move this thing forward because I think the conservation values in it are strong enough. Um, that includes about 1,600 acres of marble merlet habitat. My group is the group that uh, did the um, status report and uh, uh, the petition to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife to Service to list the marble merlet. That is a species we have worked on more than any other over the past 40 years. We have a very deep investment in it. I think this is going to be a lot better for marble merlets than what we've had. Um, in the marble merlet habitat, there will be 80% retention. So there will be a very light, light harvest, but OSU feels that they should do some research in there. Again, I don't agree with that, but I don't agree with everything in, in any plan usually. So uh, perhaps more importantly, it includes uh, 14,000 acres of clear cuts. Um, there will be clear cuts whether the state keeps it, there will be clear cuts whether OSU gets it. I, I do not believe we are gonna get away from clear cuts on the Elliott for a lot of reasons political uh, and otherwise. Uh, but those clear cuts are 100% on areas that have previously been clear cut. None of that is an older forest. I'm gonna skip this. I will go back to that older forest for a little bit though and just say that, um, you know, it's easy to get. I, I appreciate folks that are fighting for every old tree, we do too. Uh, but when we think about that 3,200 acres, remember that 93% of the older forest is being protected under this plan. Uh, that Older forest includes about 500 acres of stands that are 70 years old. So some of it is not terribly old. Um, a lot of it is fragmented. Some of it's very nice, but a lot of it is heavily fragmented. Some of it will be inaccessible. Uh, and it'll be cut over a very long term. It'll be cut over 30 years and they'll have 60 year rotations. It will also be driven by research. So uh, there are some ameliorating factors, but I don't want people to leave with the idea that there are no older trees being cut on this plan. There are some older trees being cut. I'll end by just saying that it's still a work in progress. Um, we're working on oversight and governance still. That will be the work of the next uh, 18 months too. Uh, but I am heartened by the work that's being done so far. Uh, there's a lot of agreement already about things like public notice and comment, uh, public records requests, right of third party litigation. We will fight this thing hard if we don't get those things included. This plan means nothing if we don't have good accountability transparency and enforcement mechanisms, but those are still works in progress. Uh, the financing is still work in progress, decoupling is still, and a habitat conservation plan. These things are very expensive processes to do, and so it doesn't really make sense to do them in, in their entirety until there is some green light by the state to say, yeah, this is the right direction we really think we want to go. 
doesn't mean we're going to get there, but it means that there, it's worth making a very large investment for the next two years to figure out these things. And Audubon will be going into this with the attitude that our goal is to get there. Um, I believe we can. I believe this can be a strong plan. And I believe uh, we can move the Elliott into a new era. Um, again, in my perfect world, the whole thing would be a carbon reserve, but we move somewhat incrementally in these things. It's very rare that we just protect something in its entirety. And there's a reason why the Elliott has been a battleground for 40 years. Um, there are a lot of different forces at play. The environmental community is not the only one. Uh, and we've looked at the other alternatives on the table. I don't think anything will come close to this. I think if you look at the North Coast HCP, which the environmental community just endorsed for the Tillamook and Clatsop forest, you'll find and that the protections on that those forests are far, far, far below what we're securing here. Um, there is a hearing on Tuesday. Public comment period is over. And so with that, I will stop. Sorry if I went too long. Bob, that was perfect. Your timing was just great. Um, and I'm going to briefly introduce Doug Pollock, who's a Corvallis resident and uh, helped found the group, uh, Friends of OSU Old Growth. Doug is very familiar with uh, Oregon State's uh, Department of Forestry's management of, of their research forest right here, which has led him and many others to question their sincerity of, of, uh, of, manage, of what they mean by research uh, management. It looks an awful lot like uh, industrial logging in, in many places. So with, with that said, I'll let Doug uh, finish his own introduction and, and begin his presentation if he's ready. Doug, you on? All right, I'll give it a try here. Can you hear me? Indeed, and see you too. Okay, I'm gonna do a screen share here. See if I can get my slideshow working here. Let's see. All right. Does that look okay? It does. It's great. Okay. Great. So my name is Doug Pollock. I'm uh, the founder of the Friends of OSU Old Growth Group in Corvallis. And I have been following OSU's forestry issues for about 34 years. Uh, but I got most actively engaged last summer when I was uh, the one who discovered that they had cut the old growth uh, out of my house here. Uh, northwest of Corvallis. And um, so we, we uh, it's, it's been a long journey. I've, I've spent several thousand hours since then uh, advocating and uh, trying to learn about the College of Forestry's uh, inner workings. And we now have about 700 supporters uh, from all around the state and different places in the country even who um, are on our mailing list and who are, you know, emailing to you and to find the answers. <laughs> um, so, uh, Let's see here. So this is what uh, the, the I want to back up for a minute and go into some of the background in OSU's forest management history because I think it's really relevant to what they're proposing for the Elliott. Um, this is a the only picture I actually have of the old growth that was cut uh, last year, and these are my sons and we were hiking there a couple of years ago. But these were, uh, as you can see from the picture, these were really iconic trees that were. Uh, you know, a short distance from a popular trailhead right along the main road in the forest and generations of neighbors, OSU forestry people, uh, recreational users enjoyed these trees. They were just iconic, beautiful trees. And this was um, what basically what, what happened to them. Uh, you know, the OSU College of Forestry puts gates at, uh, on the logging roads, puts up signs. They gave us five hours of notice. Uh, before they did the, the cut, it was moved forward three months ahead of their schedule. And they put up signs that say, you'll be arrested and prosecuted if you violate their closure. And I was just coming down by chance at night on a run and, and uh, didn't know it was closed. And then I saw all the trees across the road. And then I went up the next day to take pictures. But you can see here, you know, these are the big old growth logs on the right. And these are typical logs over here on the left. So, you know, these are really big trees. They, um, they knew that they were average age of the stand they thought was 167 years, I think. So they knew uh, for generations, they knew that these were old growth trees and should have been protected. After trees were cut, the um, harvest manager in Corvallis told neighbors that they absolutely did not cut any old growth trees. He 
tried to explain that the stumps we saw up there were from uh, previous logging, <laughs> which was pretty hard to understand. And it started this long uh, history of a uh, narrative, this false narrative, these lies that we got from, from everyone at OSU and the leadership from the dean to their communications director. They claimed that the trees had to be cut because there were signs of mortality in the stand. We got a hold of their uh, timber crews, which showed only 4% diseased and dying trees, which is a healthier than normal stand. We had area photographs showing the trees, you know, didn't have a lot of dead crowns. They kept insisting they had to cut the trees. They made up a four page press thing that said they had to cut them because of OSHA risks, even though there was absolutely nothing, no substance to that. And eventually what happened was they blacklisted me. They stopped um, answering all my emails. They wouldn't respond to my, um, my claims that the research force director had told their public representative on one of their committees not to share any information with me. And, you know, I filed an ethics complaint, but basically they used everything they, they could to stonewall, to blackmail, I mean, blacklist to um, keep us from, from getting answers to what happened. Here's, uh, you can see some 300 to 400 year old trees. And, you know, this is probably a three to 400 year old tree. These down logs were only brought back because Norm Johnson, uh, Professor Emeritus, who, who was a supporter of our group, went to the dean, the interim dean at that time and demanded that they bring back uh, some down wood. Otherwise, they wouldn't be there because they hauled all of it away. Uh, you can see large slash piles here that uh, there were somewhere between 50 and 60 large slash piles. Some of these were 15, 20, 25 feet high. This one was probably at least 25 feet high and they burn them all. You can see the pickup truck up here in the right. It gives you an idea of the scale, but they, um, this is their standard practice in OSU's industrial forestry here in their research forest. They scrape up everything on the ground, put it in big piles and burn it. And um, we estimated in this cut alone, they burned 800 to 1,000 tons of slash. And I had sent them email after email ahead of this, asking them not to burn the slash. I had professors who said there were research opportunities that would be really interesting to study. And that's just not their approach. You know, their, their approach is this kind of antiquated, you know, a clean forest is a healthy forest. We need to burn this stuff and get in the business of planting more trees. Um, that was actually what the interim dean told me when we were, um, uh, let's see, I've got the wrong. <laughs> I, I that's a good wrong picture person. though. Identify this man here. On yeah, your this is Norm Johnson. See, I've got the wrong uh, version of my PowerPoint. I've got to get the, uh, <laughs> I'm going to have to take a moment here and stop. Let stop them know there. who Norm Johnson is too. These folks don't know. Yeah, um, I'm sorry for this. I just realized, um, yeah, so Norm is Professor Emeritus from OSU and um, there's Boone Kaufman, another um, professor at OSU who's now retired, Debbie Johnson. Um, I don't know if you can still see, <laughs> am I still on screen share? No, we no, we've still just got your face. Okay, I gotta get my. Uh, I'm sorry for the delay here, but I I gotta find, find your my... find your find your, your. In the meantime, does anybody have any comments? Anything that they want to mention so far? Well, just one more thing about Norm Johnson. He's one of the one of the authors of the of the Northwest Forest Plan, which came out, I believe, in the in the late in the mid late nineties. May have been a little earlier. May have been a little later. My memory is just so, and, so. And what was specific about that plan? Can you comment Doug, more about? Doug, Doug, do you want to answer yeah. that or Francis? Yeah, you just a that? second. I got to make sure I find. Okay, I but think I got the. I'm just giving right more time. Here. I'm just yeah. giving more time to Doug to look for the right file. Yeah, so I've, well, I can speak to that. Okay. Go ahead. Um, I could, I could speak to that if you can hear me. Uh, you know, I went and looked when the when the idea was first brought up that we wanted the Oregon State University to manage the Elliott State Forest. I went and looked at the McDonald Douglas Forest. I looked at this timber sale that that was terrible timber sale that they did. You know, and some of their other forests up near Portland, and it seemed like the only thing they researched was how to clear cut forests. You know, they didn't do anything else. But I think what they really did on their forest was to get money. I mean, the, the whole research force was to get money to provide for the new buildings on campus. Now, I believe that there's been talk 
about when they take over the Elliot, but they don't do that. You know, that, um, that their money stays for managing the forest and not for their buildings at OSU. And the other important thing is, this is why it's so important to have public oversight. Uh, and so we want their governance plan to include uh, a public, you know, notifications of what they want to do so we can go out and look and we can give them our input. And we can uh, uh, hold them to the final plan, which is going to be better than the current plan. Remember, we're going to go into the uh, uh, DSL meeting uh, saying, well, so far it's a lot better than what ODF did, and it's a hell of a lot better than selling it to Lone Rock Timber, uh, but, we w and it, but we would like it to be better yet and to encourage them to um, uh, address some of the still the problem areas because all we can do from this point on is get better. It's better than it was, and we can get better in the future. Thank you, Francis. Let's go back to Doug's presentation. You ready, Doug? All right. Yeah. Can you see that slide there? Yes. Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. I've, I've been working almost nonstop the last day and a half. <laughs> I have so many versions of my thing. I was putting final touches on just 20 minutes ago. So. <laughs> um, so what I wanted to talk about is just what we found to be the primary failures of the, of uh, OSU's College of Forestry. And, you know, they, they operated for a a full decade from 2009 to 2019 without a forest management plan. Um, the plan was abandoned without any official notice in 2009, and it was only reinstated after the old growth cutting and all the controversy that erupted. They had no uh, GIS staff or forest inventory updates for a full decade from 2008 to 2018. Debbie Johnson was the person in charge of that, and they let her go in 2008. Uh, they conducted 13 harvests, large harvests in McDonald Forest near Corvallis that were violations of their four acre limit in the plan. Some of the cuts were 25 to 31 acres. And so we're not talking uh, minor violations. These are wholesale, wholesale <laughs> large scale violations. They cut 166 acres of northern spotted owl nesting roosting foraging habitat that their plan had uh, promised to protect. They also cut 16 acres of old growth last summer. That was this big controversy, I guess most of you have heard about. That was a clear violation of the plan, even though the OSU Elliott team were privately insisting it was not long after the Dean had publicly acknowledged it was a mistake. Uh, they had an amazing, very progressive forest management plan for the Blodgett Forest, a 2,500 acre forest up near Klatskany. And that was also abandoned and uh, cut with, they cut uh, wholesale <laughs> large amounts of timber to raised $6 million for the forestry building cost overruns last year. And um, there's also a very highly credible uh, record or, or report of uh, timber theft in the early 90s, a whistleblower who was fired from the college and he went to the governor at the time, Barbara Roberts reported it to her whist whistleblowing division. And when they came to investigate at the college, all the records had magically been scrubbed to remove any of the um, information that he had copied and it was done, uh, he was fired by the Dean at the time. So it was not uh, a minor infraction. It was the entire, uh, you know, from the leadership of the college on down was in on this, uh, apparently on this um, theft. Um, they've had no collaborative process, public process for forest planning ever. You know, we've been insisting for years, uh, going back over three decades. And occasionally when there's a big controversy, they'll have a public meeting, but they, um, they just generally don't have any public process that is um, anything re related to what you would normally consider a public process. When we ask questions, uh, if we dig or push a little bit too hard, they always say, well, there's the public records process. But uh, anybody who knows how that works knows they have a team of lawyers who are there to try to uh, drag their feet and figure out how to minimize any information they share. They have an enormous amount of funding from the timber industry from the $5 million fund that pays for the Dean's salary from the former CEO of Roseburg Forest Products to 14 endowed chairs in the college more than any other in the university. Scholarships, um, their $70 million forestry lab and building were paid for almost, uh, well, mostly with uh, timber industry donations. And another example is they never did carbon assessments that were called for in their 2005 plan. 
when I asked the research force director why, he said, I can't find anybody to do them. <laughs> and I pointed out that they had some of the world's leading experts in forest carbon in, in, uh, in the college, and he might try asking them if they wanted to get involved. And he said they had no interest. And then when I emailed Mark Carmen and uh, Bev Law, they, they both said they would be happy to help out. They'd never been asked. Um, and then there's their approach to slash burning. I got the records. I searched, I filed a uh, public records request with the Oregon Department of Forestry and found that last year alone, they burned 3,200 tons of slash. And we have reasons to believe that's probably only a third to a half of what they actually burn because it's um, grossly underreported and there's no audits. So when, I, when it comes to OSU's management of research for us, I really want people to understand that the best judge of their future behavior with the Elliott, with any research forest of the ones they own, is past behavior. Uh, to, to think anything else is really wishful thinking. I mean, the Elliott is in a relatively remote place. They can't even manage their forests. They're in Corvallis that receive, you know, 170,000 visitors a year. How would we ever expect them to be held accountable to anything they're doing in the Elliott in the remote section of the forest where they'll have uh, contractors doing the logging? This is a cut from 2020, just one of many they do. Um, this had a stand age of 84 years on average. And, you know, the industry is doing 40 year rotation. So I'm not sure what kind of research they're doing here, but I think most of the research justification for this was they wanted to look at a cut that was aesthetically pleasing from across the valley on the other side where nobody lives. And they said they left 4.5 trees per acre, which means there's gotta be 90 trees somewhere there in the clear cut in the 20 acres, but uh, I think you'd be hard pressed to find them. Uh, but this, you know, I just want people to understand that when OSU talks about research forests that they've managed, it's intensive forestry, and there's very little uh, peer-reviewed, if any, peer-reviewed research that goes on. Yeah, the, the interim dean admitted that to that to us uh, last year before he left. Okay, I'm going to transition now a little bit to the coast range, and, and, and this is a really great map that I found online that shows the uh, clear cuts in over a 16 year period from 2001 to 2017 in the coast range. You can see Eugene here, Corvallis. Clear cuts are in purple. Yeah, the clear cuts are in purple, right? Yours. And um, if we zoom in a little bit, you know, there's Eugene up there and the, the coast. And then that's where the Elliott is right over there. So you can kind of see, I, I didn't do a great job on the map editing. I couldn't <laughs> cut it out quite right. But, but you can see that that little spot there is where there's this relatively, uh, you know, there's kind of a refuge, if you will, because of the controversy that's happened that, that uh, Bob and his group and others have litigated. And then if we look a little closer here, you can kind of see. So the, I want everyone to understand the context here that you have, you know, millions and millions of acres of coast range forests, which are primarily industrial forest lands, which have been ravaged, which have been, you know, <laughs> wholesale log decimated for generations. And we have this one area here that's that's left that's, you know, admittedly fragmented in some degree and to some degree and been cut, but it's still a relative, uh, and it's like an island of of some older trees in the context of this, for, this coast range that's been decimated. This is a picture that Francis took here um, of the, um, the Millicoma Cougar timber sale and her, her note on the photo said logging started there in the summer of 2010. So I would assume these trees are probably gone. And this Francis, is in the Elliott Francis as well. Got the, yeah, Francis has after pictures too, good. Oh, great. <laughs> this is in the Elliott well as well. Another picture from Francis, um, the crystal, cold crystal cut in 2011. And here's one overlooking Loon Lake, which is up in the Northeast corner of the Elliott. Um, but I just want people to understand, like, this is the context of what has gone on in the Elliott. Is, um, I found this cartoon, which kind of summed it up OSU's proposal for me. It's like, develop half, only half of whatever natural habitat remains. And you keep repeating that, and eventually you get to the, the, uh, the compromise, the inevitable result of compromise. So this is, um, this is the OSU Elliott State Research Forest proposal, but it's not the version that Bob uh, <laughs> has seen. It's... Uh, it's my own uh, version here. You can see the rip going down the, the center of this map. And that's, that's roughly on the line where the conservation area up in the Northwest is separated from the managed 
matrix down here on the right. I found a beaver logo from 1973, which I thought was appropriate given the, uh, the research they're proposing in their plan, which is decades. It's based on a 30 year um, old research model that really has very little relevance for what's going on in Oregon today. So here's a few slides I wanted to show that give, you know, for me, it's like these three pictures kind of tell it all. You don't have to spend a lot of time wading through this 106, now 120 whatever page report. It's just a colossal piece of jargon and, and obfuscation. This map shows the, um, the age of the, the trees classes in the Elliott and the darker ones are the older trees. You can see they're scattered, you know, there's clumps of older trees scattered quite widely in the Elliott. And then there's the marble murelet in red and the spotted owl habitat. This is from an Oregonian um, article a couple of years ago. But it's interesting to me because it shows, you know, that both the older stands and the marble murelet and the northern spotted owl are, are widely distributed in the Elliott. It's not an issue of, you know, there's a lot in the, north, in the west only. It's, it's spread out all over in this habitat. Now, this is OSU's map, if you compare. So there, you know, Bob showed you this, and this is the conservation reserves. But keep in mind, those are, those are open for 20 years for a restor restoration logging, which, you know, even if you have the best circumstances with knowledgeable people who are there on the ground, which you probably won't have, OSU staff doing a tr per tree selection, I can't imagine they would. Um, they're still gonna have equipment in there. They're still gonna be disrupting that forest uh, for 20 years. And, you know, Bob mentioned that they're not gonna get a lot of revenue out of that. Well, in the last Elliott Advisory Committee meeting, OSU had $2 million a year in revenue coming out of the reserves. And so it is a substantial amount of money, a substantial amount of timber that's gonna come out of there over the next 20 years. The other, um, Part here, this, this eastern and southern part shows this kind of complicated mix of all these different zones, and they have even more than what I've shown here. They have them broken down into, you know, 400 sub-watersheds, I think. But what, what it basically shows me is that the OSU plan will continue, will perpetuate fragmentation in the Elliott in perpetuity. So by having all these light green clear-cut areas all over the whole eastern and southern half, even though you have these reserves and little pockets, you're perpetuating the fragmentation of the past. And, you know, I think that's just really obvious to see from the pictures is this is what the habitat looks like. This is what's going to be, you know, long-term, the contiguous reserve and then the smaller reserves. Um, so, you know, Bob kind of talked about this, but 40% in the conservation reserve 60% in the matrix, what I call a matrix. So it's that mix of clear cutting 3000 acres of older trees that will be cut, whether they're thinned or however you want to define that selective thinned, the trees will be cut. <laughs> and then 15,000 acres or whatever, somewhere in that neighborhood in those reserves on that side. So the best, you know, really the best judge of the plan's credibility from a scientific basis comes from, from two guys. And, you know, I found it really interesting. I mean, everybody I talk to in Northwest Forestry knows these guys. They're highly revered. They're highly respected. Jerry Franklin and Norm Johnson, they were part of the, the two guys in the Gang of Four that wrote the Northwest Forest Plan in 1994. And they both went to OSU. Uh, Norm's a professor emeritus. They both, I think Jerry was involved in setting up the H.J. Andrews Research Forest for OSU. But they are, you know, they are just like icons of the, <laughs> they have so much experience, 110 years or more between them. And so, you know, if you want to know about the OSU plan, what better people to ask? I mean, also, I have to point out, they are really big fans of the college. They are ardent, ardent supporters. Norm was on the exploratory committee back until July of last year. So, you know, he, he is, he's, the college is his family. Um, so here's what they said last December at the land board meeting when um, the governor left early because she had a, another meeting booked and didn't hear any of the public testimony. I wish she had stuck around and listened to them. They said there is no ecological or environmental rationale for harvesting the old, older natural forest in the LA State Forest. Keep in mind, this is OSU had their plan put together to target those older trees. Even last year, a year and a half ago, they were already including harvesting significant amounts of older trees. 
they, um, you know, they said that the, basically there is no, uh, there is no harvest of trees over 100 years of age in any of our public lands in the Pacific Northwest. Since the Northwest Forest Plan, there's been kind of a stalemate and then it's become kind of a precedent that they're no longer cutting older trees. And, you know, I like the term that Norman and Jerry said is there's no longer a social license for such logging. Uh, they also said they're the cornerstone of, car of climate change mitigation strategies. And they said that any attempt to harvest them will be met with skepticism at the, at the, at the best. <laughs> And they said it will be highly divisive and it's gonna ultimately make implementation, implementation of the plan impossible. So this is what Norman Jerry said a year ago before the land board, before the advisory committee meeting. And you never know it based on what OSU is proposing in their draft plan today. There have been, as far as I can tell, as far as Norm told me, there's, there's no significant changes in their targeting of older trees. Maybe they're, they're cutting a little bit less. I don't know, it's hard to tell. But um, it, it's, it's just, I find it both, insult, you know, it's really insulting, it's astounding that they would treat these guys that way and not embrace their feedback and ask them to be part of the process. So Jerry wrote some emails, uh, exchanged some emails with, uh, with members of the OSU team and then Norm and Jerry both um, weighed in with comments about the current draft plan and here's what they said, you know, they, they didn't stop their criticism last year. They, Jerry even wrote that he intended to be quiet, but he's so bothered by what they're still planning to do in the plan that he felt compelled to, uh, to enter comments. He wrote five pages of comments. He said that they, um, you know, they need to start by looking at what are the needs, what are the, the research needs that are important to the problems of Oregonians? They haven't done that. He said they're getting the, putting the cart before the horse because they're they're planning this major experiment without conducting an analysis of the needs and without even becoming familiar with the property. Now, I'm sure they'll say, well, they're gonna do that over the next couple of years, but their plan is so um, far along. It's like this train moving down the tracks that any change to it now just seems increasingly unlikely. And he also said that the, the experiment they're proposing is badly flawed compromises development of the research potential and lacks significant relevance to the management of Oregon's forests. I mean, these, to me, this strikes me like these are academics who are highly respected and words like these are really strong in the academic world. The proposed experiment violates basic principles of, <laughs> you know, it's like you read a this scathing critique and it's it's hard to understand how the dean the new dean who who jerry franklin respects or used to <laughs> at least how they can continue to keep selling this you know jerry specifically attacks their structural framework for the whole research which is this thing called triad and he says it has no relevance it's it's not they're not conducting it properly it's normally done on a state or country scale and they're trying to do it in this little tiny part of the Elliot and he says it's just completely backwards and so um, you know I, I take their word I, I'm not a scientist but when they have this this harsh scathing critique it tells me that there's something fundamentally wrong with the science of the plan you can try to make a deal and justify it in terms of your conservation you know gains but I don't think that gives you any um, validity to say the science is there because it's clearly not. Okay, I'd like to talk for a moment about the governance proposal um, because this is this is a very troubling sign to me. Um, these are, I've highlighted things from the OSU governance um, wording here, but this is their their flow chart. I'm sorry, it's kind of hard to read, but basically um, they, they have an advisory committee they're proposing as the only really independent entity as an oversight entity, but it doesn't really have a lot of teeth. It would meet, they said, not less than once every six months, it would conduct an annual audit. It would be chosen by state, somebody in the state, they don't know who. And the, the, um, the rest of the forest though is gonna be, the forest will be transferred, the, the title and the deed will be transferred to the OSU Board of Trustees that uh, will be the highest oversight body. <clears throat> and the dean will be empowered and all the people under him to manage the forest. So the advisory committee for the Elliott State Research Forest is really the only independent entity. But what they've done here that's really alarming to me is if you look at the wording, they, they, they have a big section, it's really buried in there and you got to pick it apart. They talk about this committee 
doing their annual assessment. So, you know, you have to have an independent audit to make sure these guys are complying with what they're supposed to do. And they say in their wording here, the assessment will be a consensus statement, okay? So OSU's lawyers, presumably, are already laying out this process to say, we're gonna have this committee and oh, by the way, they have to reach agreement. They have to all be in consensus in their statement that they're gonna come out with when they do their audit because we can't have anybody disagreeing with our approach to forestry. And I just find it you know, extremely arrogant and alarming that they would put that kind of wording in the framework, the agreement for the forest. That shows me that they are just approaching it the way they always approach their forestry, this autocratic approach to forest management. They also say, and number four down here, as a condition of appointment, each member will work to support the plan, the vision, the foundation, even though they weren't part of that. that. And so what they're doing is basically saying, you guys got to take a pledge of allegiance here. You got to hold up your hand and say, I promise I'm going to follow the OSU plan and so help me God. And again, I just find that, you know, that's like completely contrary to the purpose of this advisory committee. Like if you want to have any independence, any credibility, you can't have a, uh, a condition of appointment that says, oh, we're only going to have people on here who agree with our plans to do all this. So to me, these are very troubling signs. Um, there, I know there's discussions going on now, for example, with Cascadia Wildlands and various people and, you know, maybe the committee, I'm not sure if Bob's part of that. But again, it's all, it's not happening in the public realm. There's being you know, I get the impression there's these deals going on that, and, and lawyers involved and all this stuff with DSL and OSU and the groups, and it does not serve the public interest. The public needs to know what's going on with these things. Um, Doug, this, Doug, is this a decent place to pause and let yeah. Francis make some comments and perhaps Ken Carloni would have some cogent uh, comments and then we could open it up to everybody else to ask questions. And, and I'm sure Bob probably has some things he wants to add. Yeah, uh, at I, this point in time. One, I've got a few more slides. I could just finish them up if you want. I don't want to drag yeah, on too be long. fairly quick about it because okay. you're, you're running a little long right now. Okay, sure. So this is their OSU's proposed management structure. I just want to point out They've got 14 full-time forest management and operations staff, um, which you know is going to mean that they, they're saying they need to make $5.7 million a year in logging revenue in perpetuity. So this is a very um, heavy, high overhead, I think. It's kind of their classic model. Um, Bob talked about the advisory committee members. I don't share his uh, assessment about the, them being a uh, representative of Oregonians in general. Um, I, I agree that there are a, a bunch of different stakeholders, but I don't think they represent the values of Oregonians. This is the list I have um, that's on the DSL website. So I'm, there aren't any tribal members on here in this, but it's what I worked off of. But when I looked at this, you know, there's a couple of things that jumped out at me as two members are associated with Douglas Timber Operators. The guy who's their consulting forester is on the board of Douglas Timber, Timber Operators. Um, and there's Paul Beck. There's two hunters' rights groups. I don't know why you need two hunters' rights groups when hunters are hunting is, you know, declining for decades in Oregon. Um, and half the members have very strong ties to the local government, very strong vested interests in the economics of this. Um, and there's three members who have very strong uh, backgrounds with OSU, who, who went to OSU, degrees from OSU. And then there's one guy from Douglas County who is a, you know, a really outspoken critic as well. So what I want to say is, you know, who is not on the Elliott Advisory Committee? There were no climate change experts, okay? So if you're going to talk about climate change being a priority, why was there no one on the committee from Global or, you know, Oregon Global Warming Commission? There were no forest carbon experts. There were no forest ecologists. There were no wildfire researchers, no representatives of mainstream recreational groups, hikers, runners, mountain bikers. No leaders in ecological forest management. They could have put Zena Forest, Hyla Woods, somebody who's on the progressive end of forestry on there. So these are groups which were not on there. You know, climate change, OSU's own forest carbon experts, Norm and Jerry were not on the committee. Um, you know, a whole host of different groups that represent, I think, better represent the interests of Oregonians than the decidedly biased uh, group that Director Walker picked. So I'm just going to end here with a slide that's kind of my take on some of the, you know, this was my an hour before the meeting, what strikes me as the things that needed to be done here. 
Um, I think a reset is needed for the process. I think there's strong justification for that. The committee going forward, if there is a continuation or a new committee, it must be changed to represent Oregonians' interests and values. It belongs to all Oregonians. It should not be heavily weighted in terms of conservative timber, Douglas, Coos County representatives. The research plan is fundamentally flawed and it needs to be changed. Uh, Norman Jerry's critique is unassailable. And for OSU to ignore it, for anybody else in the committee to ignore it is really unconscionable. These guys are the experts, pay attention to what they're saying. Um, OSU needs to earn our trust before we're gonna give them any forest for management uh, responsibilities. Why not start with a research management only regime and let them do research only for a few years and say, we're gonna put a halt on forest on harvest other than the research for the time being. Um, the governance proposal has a lot of serious flaws it has to be fundamentally changed and that needs to be in a public transparent process. The land board um, should delay action. We're gonna have Shamia Fagan on there who is gonna be a, a huge change from Bev Clarno and that's a very positive thing and she's gonna be on there in 26 days or whatever. Um, OSU must acknowledge the public comments and, and incorporate them and there's no way they've done that in their current plan. 3,000 you know, 3,000 pages of comments, and they did not go through that and make changes in three days. And they must, uh, both OSU and DSL, have to commit to a fully transparent collaborative process moving forward. It has not been, despite the assurances from the director and the other people, it has been anything but a transparent process as, as I and many other people in our group have found as we try to get information. Um, these are opportunities to, Bob went through some of this, but we have a really short window here, 10 a.m. Monday, December 7th. You can still submit writ written testimony to the land board for their meeting. Uh, and then spoken testimony, you can sign up to speak a minute or two or whatever they're gonna give us. Um, and then you can send, always send feedback to the governor, secretary of state or treasurer using those uh, links there. Um, but I really thank people for your time and attention. And, and I would, um, if you're interested, you can go to our site and sign up for our email list. I'm always happy to have supporters answer questions. If you have ideas to exchange, I'd love to hear from you. And uh, I'll leave it at that. So thanks so much. Thank you, Doug. I'm impressed, Bob. I was truly impressed with your presentation also. I'd like to ask Francis Etherington now for any comments or anything else she wants to share with us. And then I'm gonna ask Ken Carloni for the same and then, then open it up. Take it away, Francis. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Doug, for that great and long presentation. And you're right, we have a lot of things that we can comment on to the state land board, um, either in written or oral comments. And I think we should all weigh in on this. As one who has been monitoring the timber sales on the Elliott State Forest since 2001, I wanna say that it used to be really horrible. I mean, it used to be, you know, 37, 40 million board feet a year. And now that they want to go down to 17 million board feet a year, for me, I like, oh, God, that is so much better than what it was under the management of the Oregon Department of Forestry. It was really bad there. And then uh, went from the Oregon Department of Forestry to the proposal by Lone Rock Timber. And uh, the state of Oregon wanted to sell it to Lone Rock Timber and Lone Rock Timber says, oh yeah, we're only gonna take 25 million board feet a year off of it. And we have these little sections of reserves. And so that was horrible. I was really alarmed at that. So now the proposal we have on the table now, I'm like, in a way, I'm like, oh, phew, at least we don't want to go backward. We don't want to go back to the old way of managing the old proposals on how to manage uh, the Elliott State Forest. We've got, I feel like we've got something now that we can tear apart so we can go forward, but not backward. So... I look forward to submitting my comments on having better public overview. That's really important. And Norman Jerry is right. What are we doing research on cutting older forests for? I mean, what re good is that research for in the future? Who's going to take advantage of that research? So uh, you got some, some really good points. And one thing I do want to point out, I felt like you, 
Doug, you might have insinuated that they were going to be thinning an older forest in the reserves. I put in my comments in, in the chat box there that when they thin in those reserves, it's only going to be in old clear cuts. They will do no thinning in, in native forests at all. So it's only, you know, mostly forests that are 40 to 50 years old These the, that were planted in high density Douglas fir that might have some ecological benefits by taking a few of those trees out to reintroduce diversity. But anyway, that's another controversial subject. So there, that's my um, comment. Thank Bob, you, Francis. Ken Carloni, are you able to offer us any insights, comments, yeah, questions? I am, I am but um, I, you know, I have some thoughts, but um, I might like to hear from, from Bob Salinger, um, in terms of, I know there's there, you know, there's been some. This is the classic half a loaf versus no loaf situation, and I know, uh, you know, it, it. Are there, are there issues, Bob, that um, that Doug brought up? I know Francis just, you know, uh, just made a clarification. Are there any more clarifications that you that you'd like to make in terms of? You know, clarifying your position, and then I'll I'll have a couple of comments after that. Sure, there, there are a variety of things I'll, I'll focus on. I think the most important ones, um, as far as the oversight goes, it is still a work in progress. As I said, you know that that's that's part of the work of the next eighteen months and getting those these things all legally binding. Uh, we will insist upon, and I think we're making progress on uh, public records commissioner what we have with the state, uh, public notice and comment consistent what we have with the state, I think actually stronger in some ways, I hope, um, and uh, right to third party litigation. And so, you know, it's a matter of putting in the right structure. If we can't get it, we won't support it. Um, but, uh, you know, I think the enforcement mechanisms uh, will be robust. That's something we don't have on other OSU forests right now. I think some of the reading between the lines was way, way off base. I don't have time to go through it all, but I will say that um, what, what they intend is that there will be, uh, we're not going to be taking votes. We're not going to have a committee that takes a vote and, you know, supports X, Y, or Z because seven out of 12 people agree to it. What we wanted and what I think is the right approach on an, on an advisory committee is that we will capture the variety of opinions. We will work toward trying to figure things out, um, and we will capture all the opinions. Also, uh, in terms of, um, uh, agreeing to be consistent with the, the plan that we adopt, that's not a surprise on an advisory committee. You, you don't put people on there to try and undermine the agreements that we come to. Uh, you, put, you put people on there to try and make it stronger, hold people accountable, but I'm not surprised by terminology that says, you know, people are going to work in good faith to try and implement the plan that, that is developed. Um, as far as uh, Norm and Jerry goes, um, I, I don't hold them in the same esteem that Doug apparently does. I, I have great respect for them. They were the authors of the Northwest Forest Plan. Uh, but Norm and Jerry have also been in conflict with the environmental community. And I would be careful what you ask for, because the fact is, Norm and Jerry don't like the 35,000 acre reserve. For those people that think that the fragmentation is a problem, that 35,000 acre reserve is huge. Um, they don't think that's necessary. We don't want the current landscape on the Elliott with a whole bunch of little dots on a map. We want a really, really big reserve. And then we want to protect as much of the rest of the old forest as possible. Um, the, the environmental community demanded certainty in this process. We weren't willing to go into a deal with, with OSU saying, hey, just figure it out over time. Take the $220 million forest and hey, you, we'll trust you to figure out how it looks. We went into this saying, we want to know what is going to be protected and we want it locked up in perpetuity. And that's part of what's driven some of the way it's structured. Now, I don't like some of what's in their plan. I don't agree with their spare and share. I wouldn't cut any older forest. Ideally, there wouldn't be any clear cuts, but I think there is a good research platform process in place that we will, will continue to refine that will allow us to ameliorate some of that over time. And one of the things we are saying is that this thing should be much more focused on climate resiliency, much less focused on their spare and share. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, 
I, last thing I'll say is I think people ought to consider the alternative that is on the table, which is, is that we go through the uh, straight up habitat conservation planning process with, by the state and the feds, which will give us a combination of protected areas, reserves, and clear cuts. Um, that, that's what it will result in. Uh, it will be result in a much higher level of board feet, I suspect. It will continue to be driven by the common school fund and uh, there will be no science really on it. The reason we will do clear cuts under the state's planning process will be because we want to get wood out of the forest. And so while I don't agree with everything in the OSU plan, I think, and I think Francis was alluding to this, it gives us a chance to really bring in the scientists and have them look at the impacts and see how we can ameliorate some of these things we don't like over time. So do I agree with everything OSU has in there? Absolutely not. I, I would design it differently. Do I think it gives us a much better foothold and much, much more certainty and much, much more continuity to the forest? Yeah, I think it does. And that's why I'm willing to take it. If I had a clear pathway to get to full protection of this forest, I would take that. So I appreciate the question. Could I yeah. add in a couple of things? Sure. I was just gonna say, um, I don't think it has to be an either or proposition. You know, either you buy into this OSU plan or it reverts back to DSL. I really think what needs to happen is OSU needs to be more accommodating to the values they profess to be following. And the plan does not do that. It's been this, this going down this railroad <laughs> track from last year um, and they, they seem intent. I know I had dinner with Bob a year ago, over a year ago, and you know he was telling me how the OSU people were asking kind of confidentially after hours, like how old of a tree, how old of the trees can we cut in the Elliott and not get in trouble? And, you know, that was, you know, from their consultant that they had that Tom Tuckman and John Sessions involvement and all the people that they hired and the way they went about the whole thing showed a really strong agenda uh, right from the start. And so I think what we need to see to have confidence that they've, you know, that they, they're going to, I mean, there, there is an option. They could make some substantive changes to the plan. They could, they could stop going about the governance in such an autocratic way. They could, you know, um, embrace more of the stuff that Jerry and Norm have said. Um, they could make some really substantive changes. And I just don't see that in any of the revisions of the plan. They seem very intent on a kind of a command and control approach. And as far as the research too, I mean, I think I, I've sent comments in about, you know, I looked at their marble mirrorlet, um, the very first one that Matt Betts and Jim Rivers proposed for the Elliott. And they, they essentially are saying, we're gonna go into the older stands and we're gonna do some thinning and we're gonna see if we can get away with doing that without impacting the birds. And if we find that it doesn't impact the, the birds, then that's great and it might have implications for you know, doing more logging in, in forests, older forests. If it does impact them, then it says we should follow the same old model of industrial forestry where you have clear cuts and you have reserves. And when I look at that, you know, what strikes me is there's, there's no conservation upside to that. You know, the, the federal forests have largely stopped, they've stopped cutting the older trees. So the most obvious thing to me that jumps out is, you know, if they do their study and they found, find that, yes, you know, they could maybe thin 10% of the trees within a certain radius of the nesting sites, well, then the very next thing that's going to happen is the industry is going to be chomping at the bit to get into the older forests, the federal forests, and they'll use that OSU research as their justification. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to criticize the research people, but I think that's the problem with this whole approach is it's all research that's predicated on cutting trees. And OSU has this long, you know, 110 year history of the College of Forestry being funded by the timber industry. You know, this heavy driver, you know, influencing how they think. And so, you know, I think you have to be careful just saying, well, just because it's research, we bow to it and say, oh, this is great. You have to look at, does the research have relevance for society? What are the implications of this? And is it, is it fitting the, the needs and values of society? So. Ken Carloni. Yeah, I, I, I again, I, I, I really appreciate uh, your perspective, Doug, and your hard work, uh, and, and Bob's work, Francis's work, all of the rest of you who have been watchdogging this thing. And I think that's, that's kind of the key. I mean, we do, have, we do have allies within OSU. So it's not, it's not, 
not so much of a monolith there that it's us against them sort of a situation. I mean, you mentioned Bevla, you mentioned Mark Harmon, you mentioned Boone Kaufman, and and those are all folks that I think we can we can um, uh, uh, you know tag to help us um, you know we you know go from within you know to to work on this from within, and um, um, you know again I I. I watched that split right down the middle of the College of Forestry when I was, you know, I mean, I'm, a, I'm an alum and, uh, um, you know, from the late 90s. And I watched that schism go right down the middle of, of, you know, you'd sit in a seminar and half the people would be nodding their heads this way and half would be nodding their heads this way. <laughs> so, so we, you know, we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't, and, and, and you mentioned this, Doug, and I, you know, and, but we shouldn't think of, you know, as you as as a monolith there. So I think right. we do have friends from the inside. I appreciate. You know, uh, we have eyes on the ground out there, um, and we have well, at least for another four years on the federal level. At least we have. You know, we have a friendly environment coming up in that regard, and so so I'm encouraged. Um, you know, the plan has flaws, the plan has transparency flaws, Bob's pointed them out, Doug's pointed them out, um, but I'm encouraged going forward that, you know, if we, you know, with vigilance and, and um, pulling our friends in um, who are, you know, already connected, um, you know, to OSU, um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm I'm a little I'm falling a little bit on the optimistic side than the pessimistic side, but I I very much appreciate um, all of the perspectives here today, and um, and I also uh, think that um, you know there's an op hopefully there'll be you know opportunities for us to um, to suggest research and it won't. You know that what's driving research hopefully won't all be coming from inside of OSU. That those of us who are example, for example, you know, interested in other forms of carbon sequestration. You know, for example, charring wood, and you guys maybe have been following that a little bit, and I'm you know deeply involved in that right now. That that we can look at um, you know other avenues for doing the research other than you know as Doug said learning how to cut trees you know we've been learning how to cut trees for you know 100 years or whatever and we pretty well know how to cut trees the, the question is um you know how do we how do we change that mindset from how do we do right by the forest versus how much can we get away with yeah. and um and so um so i think those you know those are my comments i'm optimistic that that we can call on our our friends within the scientific community, within the OSU scientific community, to help us keep this thing on the rails. Um, so, those are my comments. Ken, would you very briefly credential yourself too? I didn't do a good job of introducing you at all. Um, I'm I'm the um, one of the founding members, along with Francis Etherington of of um, of Umqua Watersheds, and I'm currently um, the board president right now. Um, I did, uh, I got my PhD in forest ecology, you know, in the OSU uh, College of Forestry um, and um, spent uh, 31 years uh, teaching biology and natural resources at Umqua Community College, just retired two years ago um, and have uh, thrown myself into the nuts and bolts of forest management and carbon sequestration for 31 years. I've been a theoretical ecologist and a teacher, and now I've got a chainsaw in my hand. I've got biochar kilns out in the field, and I'm trying to model what responsible forest management looks like on a 380-acre forest um, that we've got in Southern Douglas County. So, um, so you know, so that's where I'm at. I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of leaning a little bit farther away from the policy aspect of things these days and more into actually putting my boots out on the ground and, and doing stuff. So that's a nutshell there. Thank you. I can, uh, George, are you taking questions? Now's the time. Go ahead. 
Okay, um, so my first question is, I thank you so much. This is very informative. Um, and I have a much better understanding of the Elliott State Forest now. Uh, what I'm wondering is how can we connect this with the Green Party and what the Green Party is doing? And I ask that in a broader context. Um, I feel like in the last 20 years, the Democratic Party has really usurped the Green Party's message. And our core message is about protecting the environment. And the, the Democratic Party has really taken control of that narrative and owned it for themselves and not given us any credit for the work that we've done. So I kind of have two questions. One is, how do we connect this issue about preserving the Elliott State Forest with the Green Party? And the bigger question is, how do we keep the Democrats from just owning this, owning this issue? Thank you. Good question, and that's a, going to be a complicated answer, I'm sure, and that's something for us to chew on. Thanks. I'm looking at the chat. I don't see. I got to scan down some. Uh, I noticed there's some other people on here. That uh, Cat Stone, I thought, made some very cogent comments uh, earlier. Cat, do you have anything to add to this? Well. <clears throat> Hi. Um, I don't really have a lot to add. Um, the idea that a Douglas fir is mature at and, and can retain water and control water flow at 80 years of age kind of leads us not to think about 40-year rotations. We're just drying out the ground and lowering the stream levels. So if we think of anything less than 120 year rotations, we're, we're not gonna get any good water management out of it. And, and that's all I, I have to contribute. Thank you. Can I break in? Please. This being David Bean, I've never met you before, Kat, but I've already fallen in love. Um, <laughs> my uh, uh, I'll just tell you a little bit of who I am. My great-grandfather was A.W. Erickson, who uh, took photographs of the redwood trees for the Columbia Exposition in 1893. Um, I uh, grew up with Gordon Robinson, who was the head forester of Southern Pacific, who uh, was fired because he refused to clear cut. Why did he not you, why was he unwilling to clear cut? Because of fire. And that's what very much alarms me uh, with the, uh, uh, what I saw about the Elliott Forest, which I, I don't have the, the patience anymore to get into jot and tittle with, with a big process like that. But to see injecting clear cuts into uh, old stands like that uh, is, to forget what Kat just said, which is, uh, let me put it in my own words, adolescent trees are much like adolescent boys. They're very thirsty and have no deep roots. And uh, to avoid fire, which I think is a huge, uh, not avoid fire, but to include fire the way Gordon Robinson did. He wrote a, pic a book, by the way, called The Forests and the Trees. Um, to include fire to raise the value of the forest uh, because it, it, you know, it does need thinning from time to time and nature has its way. Otherwise, we'd never see 2000 year old trees as my great grandfather photographed. So um, the water element is critical. And uh, to look at some of the of the maps of Oregon with all these clear cuts, which are done basically at half my age. Uh, so if I were a tree, I'd be on my third life. And the reason they do that, as I understand it, is because they monocrop and create root rot. And then they, they have to cut the trees before they get root rot. You need a variety of, of species. And uh, just to conclude, I was just moved as could be yesterday by watching the, uh, or by reading the New York Times 
magazine article, The Social Life of Forests. And I really recommend reading it and sharing that with your friends because that shows that the soil is, uh, is the immune system of the forest and it provides nourishment as well as protection. And the clear cutting is an uh, absolute violation of that. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Francis, do you have something uh, you'd like to add? Sure, I, I would like to add, uh, yeah, we don't like the clear cutting proposals on the Elliott, absolutely not. At least, not at least, but they're going to, they're proposing a rotation age of 60 years, which is a little better than the 50, 40 years from private timber industry. Also, in the, what they call the intensive management, those are only in forests that have already been clear cut. There will be no clear cutting in native forests or in older forests. So we don't like the clear cutting, but at least it's not in the native or older forest. What we don't like is the proposal to to do intensive forest management as industry does in the clear cuts like aerial herbicide spraying. We don't like that. And we would also like them to do a bigger riparian buffer. They're only doing half of what the adjacent BLM is doing. So those are some comments that be, can be given to the state land board tomorrow. Bigger riparian buffer, no aerial herbicide spraying. Thank you. Any, yeah. Uh, Other, go ahead. I'm on the stack. You're up, Charles. Um, okay, a couple of couple of questions. Well, maybe they're not questions. Um, yeah, I the the clear cuts kind of stand out to me, especially calling them research. Um, it, it seems to me that they've done quite enough clear cutting. They know what it does by now. Uh, if they really want to see what happens after you clear cut for us, then they can, there are plenty of examples. So I, I, I that to me, that part of the proposal to me is in line with, uh, now I've forgotten his name, uh, Doug's point, uh, which he didn't quite make explicit, but, but dwelt on for a while, that they can't be trusted. Uh, and so, uh, it looks like their internal management is not very good and their honesty isn't real high either. So that what, what that points to besides the clear cutting is uh, enforcement mechanisms, uh, which would obviously need, need to be much stronger than in the proposal. There's, there's really nothing there to, to check up on uh, OS, on the OSU forestry as they tr uh, manage this quotes research forest. Thanks, Charles. Uh, anything else, Charles? Oh, probably. I'll may, I may remember it later. All right. Uh, before we, I, Chuck, I before just, we, you Chuck, want me to just chime in for a second on that? Yeah, and 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 you've also been asked by. Uh, Kenny Kearns, if, if you can go back to your page at some point about links, uh, about commenting to oh, the okay. ESL, or actually it wouldn't, it's, it's yeah, ESL. I'll Later. try to get well, um, The thing I was gonna say uh, that what Charles was talking about is, is really something that jumps out at me from reading the plan. You know, the Dean has his letter up at the top and he talks in very bold terms about climate change and you know, overuse of resources and all of these things. And he also says that research will not be conducted for the purpose of earning revenue. And they also mention that several places in the plan. And yet the plan is full of things that are based on, on, a, on research, on, on revenue, a steady stream of revenue. Even their triad model diagram has a line, you know, right down the center of it that says, this is the, uh, the, the steady, uh, the, I forget what the name is, that the, 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 the standard volume of wood that they're going to get off, the, the even wood supply. And so, and then when you have that 14 people on staff that all have salaries, that all are, you know, part of the team, then that becomes this enormous, uh, you know, hungry furnace that has to be fed. And so that's really one of the fundamental, you know, kind of disconnects in the plan is how do you reconcile 
that this is going to be a research forest, but at the same time, you know, that that funding mechanism, which really strikes me as, you know, a, a hungry giant that's going to have to be fed in perpetuity to keep this enormous organization going. Thank you. Uh, Chuck Fall, you have a question or comment? I have a comment. And uh, I just want to pick up on, I guess, what Charles has observed, you know, um, and on, on Doug's point about the lack of transparency and the essentially corruptness of this. And Emma asks, you know, the Greens aren't well distinguished around their advocacy for forests. And, um, and one of the, the things that's running through all of this is, one, this is a classic case of the, the, um, the fox guarding the hen house and um, a kind of corrupted interest advancing false science. Um, this is almost like a template for, you know, how do you, how do you run a, a corrupt plutocracy is, I'm sorry to be so, you know, uh, partisan in this way. Um, and I understand Bob's, you know, you know, appreciation for the good that's in the, the existing plan. But I think Doug's, um, you know, suggestion that there could be substantive improvements and changes ought not be um, kind of given up on because it's frankly immoral that any old growth, any anything that supports biodiversity would be um, given up at this stage and age. As far as I'm concerned, we're in a state of ecological emergency and these guys are acting, these guys, the, the people on the board, I mean, and I guess there's innovations and there's some good things here, but fundamentally any call to, there is no, there is no moral grounds, there's no science grounds. As, the, uh, as Doug observed, um, the, the emeritus professors say, there's no social kind of value of doing this. And I think that's where the Greens add value in this conversation is that I think we're going to, we're more willing to take a very strong critical view, a dissident view of this kind of stuff. And I think that's what we need to be putting forth. Thank you. you. Know, to be clear, if I can respond for a second, I'm not saying don't stand by your values. I'm not saying that at all. I, I don't support cutting older trees. I don't like clear cuts either. I am willing to accept them as part of this, this deal. The degree that folks want to come in and push for more that's fine, but I think there's, uh, I think some of the terminology around immorality and corrupt, uh, I'll honestly push back on that a little bit. I, I don't trust OSU, but uh, remember the state also um, clear cut this thing legally for decades, took three lawsuits, they sold it illegally, they tried to sell it. So, you know, it, it's kind of easy to, to go after OSU. I think it's more important to focus on the mechanisms whether it's at the state or at OSU to hold them accountable. Uh, and uh, it took a tremendous amount of work to bring the state to heel on this thing. It was not a, a simple process. Um, you know, I think that uh, folks also do need to be thinking about where um, they want to go in terms of uh, it's very easy to listen to your own echo chamber and say that we're right and they're the only opinion out there. Uh, but there's a reason why the Elliot's been complicated for a long time. And you have the tribes, which frankly were to the right of Audubon. I think the tribes would have settled for less, uh, at least some of them at the table. Uh, I think that you have the counties, you have a variety of different interests. Uh, and how do you get all of those to a place that also results in huge ecological lift. And I think it's easy to discount um, that element of it. I heard Doug say earlier, this doesn't represent Oregonians. Uh, I think it actually represents a lot of the interests that uh, are concerned about the Elliot. I'm sure there are more out there without question, but uh, it was a, a broad array of folks that have very, very different perspectives for a variety of different reasons. and. I think just ca characterizing something that's different as corrupt is, to me is, is problematic. Nathalie here, Stack. Yes, Nathalie, you're up. Yeah, but I would like to give uh, my space to Kurt. Kurt had a really good uh, comment on the chat. Would you make, would you like to make a comment, Kurt? So, yeah. You could read it off. 
Okay. So Kurt mentioned that uh, this is what Kurt mentions. He or she, they say, um, we all come to this with our own bias. One of the points of view that is missing is the point of view of younger people. It seems almost no one is under 50, let alone under 30. There should be much more feedback surrounding global climate change and would be if younger people were involved. So I, I, since I'm on the, I was on the stack, I wanna echo exactly that sort of thing. We, be, aside from the plan, which I think is a good starting point. So that should be our starting point. Um, what uh, Doug said about the soil being the nourishment of the forest is so true. Four o'clock. David, David, David mentioned. Um, but we also, and on the, on the other side, we also need to take into account that this, the, the state lacks revenue, right? And now with the forest, with COVID, we, we're, we're under enormous uh, economic pressures. And so we need to start looking outside the box for our first, you know, sources of revenue, particularly for rural areas. I think that that's gonna have a big impact into the final decisions. Um, and uh, earlier on, we had Antonio Gisberg make a presentation about the Oregon people's rebate which is a mechanism by which actually rural economies will get a total windfall of funding. And there will be much less pressure to derive our funding from the forest. The forest is like one of us. It's like if we were exploiting, it's like it's the new slave. Um, Chuck Fall wrote a wonderful book, How Dams Fall, and he basically equates natural resources to the last slaves. We're exploiting them to the point of extinction for uh, an economy that's not sustainable and for the profits of very few because the money is not staying in the rural areas. Um, so my point was that as I agree that this plan is probably a good plan, it should, but there's a lot more that we need to do in terms of both improving the plan as was suggested here with um, Francis' suggestions as looking outside for more allies and for different sources of revenue for the state. That brings me back to Kat Stone's uh, comments she made earlier about Tax Fairness Oregon and increasing or actually reinstituting a meaningful severance tax on uh, the, the various trees that are logged in our state. Kat, are you still on? Do you, could you re reprise us on that thought again? You mean uh, the loss of harvest severance? Uh, yes, yes. Well, we used to have a six and a half percent harvest severance in Oregon. And people don't know that uh, private timber used to pay property taxes, plus they paid the harvest severance on every log that was taken out. And in the 1990, the lobbyists managed to convince the state legislature to reduce their taxes their property taxes by 95% and virtually eliminate the harvest severance. So now the harvest severance is set by the Oregon Forest Research Institute and they set it at a very small percentage and it's only enough for them to produce their propaganda that tells us how clean logging makes our water. And uh, these companies also restructured themselves financially and they formed into timber industry management organizations and real estate investment trusts. And in this way, because they are structured to pay out their profits, I think it's 90% of their profits every year go to the shareholders. And the shareholders are largely the 1%. Um, all this money, they don't pay a state tax and they don't pay a federal tax. So they are just a parasite out there. These huge, huge organizations like Weyerhaeuser. And um, we really need to think about getting foreign ownership out of our best Oregon real estate. If these uh, people don't want to contribute to the communities, which is what they should, they should provide jobs but a Timo and a REIT do not have mills. They don't have employees. 
they have a contractor that comes in with a feller buncher and cleans off the side of the hill and uh, the log truck drivers have jobs and those are the timber unity people. So we, we really need to work on extending our uh, crop rotations to 400 years. I mean, that's, that's a, an incredible thought to have, but if our forest streams are being sucked dry by these plantations, these young plantations, and then the plantations are cut in 40 years and they replant and it sucks up everything else. There is no gain for the streams. So that, that is what Tax Fairness Oregon is uh, working on. And I would have you partner with them. That's uh, Catherine Tomlinson and um, <sighs> Jody uh, Weiser. I'm writing as fast as I can, Tom. Listen. We can contact Kat really fast. Go ahead, Kat, because we can contact you back. Oh, that's fine. I, I just talk really, really fast and um, nervously. And Jody, what's Jody's last name? Wiser, W I S E R. Okay. So let me cut in here just a little bit because. Um, I helped found Tax Fairness Oregon with Jody when we went back to Washington and got Ron Wyden to change his position on the estate tax, which previously had been amazingly as a Democrat to repeal the estate tax. So I think tax policy has a lot to do with the looting that's going on and what Kat describes as looting, nothing less. And uh, um, I remembered a demonstration that I wanted to share with you that um, uh, Gordon Robinson uh, showed to the board of uh, Southern Pacific when they said that they wanted to clear cut on his land because he managed all the, their land. And he said, um, what we want to do is maximize the production on the forest. And the way you do that is to grow more fiber. And, and Kat has already mentioned, and it's obvious to anybody <laughs> of our senior age, that uh, bigger trees hold more water, not only in their stem, but also in the tremendous sponge in the ground. And especially in interspecies forests, there's a lot more deep rooted trees because Douglas fir are very shallow rooted. Um, but what he did is he, he took a pencil and he wrapped it in paper and said, this is how much we get from these uh, 40 year old trees we're cutting as uh, a crop like grass. And then he took a whiskey bottle and tried to wrap a piece of paper around it. And it wouldn't even go around the whiskey bottle. So you have to take the long end of the paper to see how much fiber you get per year from a bigger tree. And it's like, now how much do you want to grow each year? And I, as a carpenter, know that the old stable wood is beautiful to work with. And that's what we should be um, taking from the forest. And baby trees are, as I said earlier, like adolescent uh, boys or you have nothing but thirst. So um, we have more to talk about in, oh, and another word for, uh, uh, the even age management that results from clear cutting, I like to use the word fire wands because how else can you create a half mile wide, 40 foot tall wall of fire? So um, I just want to share my lingo with you. Um, was the fire, was the word behind fire wand? Like W-A-N-D? Wand. Yes, like, like yeah. a magic wand. Flash, we have the world on fire. Got it. Thank you, David. Welcome. But but hey, those those worlds on fire and that that thing you just described that was all on that new growth 
Weyerhaeuser property, right? Those are the ones that torched up like that. Well, everything gets burned once you get a 40 foot wall of half a mile wide wall of fire. Those are hard to stop. <laughs> They're hard to stop. But the, but, but the new growth uh, hortical, uh, monocultures do burn, burn more readily or not? Um, Every, anything will burn once the forest floor dries up and there's no water, right? So it's all equal opportunity uh, for, for nature to burn is what you're getting at. Well, my, I've got a lot. Yeah, this is, this is Ken's PhD here, Ken. This is what you did your PhD in, right? Well, uh, close to that. I, what, what, I, what I focused on was um, the historical ecology of the forest here on the Umpqua and how, how they were influenced by native management. And so, uh, you know, management itself is not a bad thing. We've been doing it. Humans have been doing it here for thousands of years. 35. Uh, but yeah. but, the, but um, there was a, a, a seminal paper that came out. And again, one of the researchers from, was from OSU two years ago studying the um, Douglas complex fire just to the south of us here. And, um, and so the even age plantations with the fire wands that, you know, that David was talking about, basically all the trees packed tightly together, nothing to stop fire going from crown to crown. Those um, plantations are, are far more flammable than old growth forests, even though those old growth forests contain far more fuel in terms of the biomass that could burn, they don't because the crowns are all broken up. There's gaps in between. They tend to be cooler and moister, moister because of the microclimates they create. And so, and so um, but um, uh, David is also correct that in a climate driven fire that we had experienced for the first time in, in probably, dec uh, probably centuries here, um, um, you know, the ultimate cause of the, of the Labor Day fires, you know, was climate change. The, the proximate cause of so much of that forest burning, and certainly here, you know, on the, I, uh, I know uh, Tim Inglesby's group, uh, the, the um, Fusey folks have done an analysis of the holiday farm fire, um, and, and I'm beginning an analysis of the Archie Creek fire here, uh, so much of that fire burned, 75, 80% of the stands that it burned through were plantations and, and therefore no resistance to that fire whatsoever. And so there, there, the few islands of trees, at least from my cursory analysis of the, of the heat maps, the bear reports that have been coming out, you know, the only green trees left uh, in those forests are old growth. Um, uh, you know, because they're the only ones that can resist. But, but again, David is correct that you, you get a 60 mile an hour wind driven fire surrounded by, you know, matchsticks all lined up perfectly. And there's very little survival going on there. And, and one other point that I, I might make as a general point here, and I know we're going long, but um, the, 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 there's a lot of emphasis now on you know, we should, we should focus our treatment on uh, a forest in the wildland urban interface where there are houses. And I completely agree on that. You know, we need to beef up our, our, um, uh, our zoning laws in fire prone areas to make more fire resistant housing. We need to completely continue to fund fire wising programs and community fire uh, programs. But also, uh, and, and so, but a lot of my friends are also saying, and stay out of the backcountry. You know, leave that stuff alone. But here we have these precious reserves of carbon and biodiversity, islands of them. You know, these last standing old growth stands surrounded by tinder boxes. And I also think it's incumbent upon us to look at future generations and say, you know, speaking of younger folks, right? that's their future and their kids' futures and so on. We have, you know, again, it, it, I can hear the arguments. Okay, we management, you know, intensive management got us into this, you know, how is intention, intensive management gonna get us out of this? But, you know, that bed has been made and we've got, and if we really want to save the last vestiges of those old growth from these new climate fires, in my opinion, 
you know, we have to try to introduce some resiliency to those. And so I would look, you know, kind of bringing this back to the Elliott discussion, you know, I would be looking at that um, as research, you know, the, the clear cuts are going to be happening in plantations. I would like to see a lot more of those plantations just messed up, you know, create the create the structural heterogeneity in there that not only is going to keep fire from ripping straight through the crowns, but also is going to create the kind of habitat heterogeneity that's going to support more species. So if you're going to clear cut a plantation that's already been clear cut, what are you going to put back there? If you're just going to plant another you know, set of soldier, 10 by 10 soldier rows, you're just setting the table for the next fire. And so if that research is about resiliency, great. Clear cut forests that, you know, if, it, if you've got rot pockets, if you've got uh, Swiss needle cast, if you've got some, you know, something in there in that plantation that is, you know, causing some problem or, or, or you know, or an issue that's going to spread to the next forest, like being a tinderbox. Okay, get in there and manage those forests. I'm not for clear cutting either. I, I think Clear cutting emulates nothing in history, no matter what people say. It does not emulate wildfire, you know, because it takes all of the biomass out of the, or you know, the vast majority of the biomass out of the forest. But if there the the one or the few, you know, one or two reasons I can think of from an ecological perspective to clear cut is if you have a situation where you have a diseased stand that, you know, that's potentially going to spread into other stands or, or that sort of thing. Otherwise, the only reason to clear cut is to maximize profits because you cut at that, you know, culmination of mean annual increment, right? You, if, if you're a bean counter, you want to turn dollars, you want to turn trees into dollars as soon as you can because you can grow dollars faster than you can grow trees. So if your whole perspective is 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 economic you want to turn trees into dollars as soon as you can because then you can invest them and make them grow make those dollars grow faster but if you're if you know the only reason that i can see you know legitimate ecological reason to clear cut is if you have say a series of patch cuts set up inside more even age stands because you're trying to get heterogeneity diversity in there or if you have some rot pockets, or if you have Swiss needle cast, or some other, you know, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, pine beetle outbreak, or that sort of thing, um, then you know, then I can I can see that. But otherwise, you know, there's no, there is no reason to there is no eco, I agree with Norman Jerry. There is no ecological reason to clear cut. Thank you, Ken. This has been a wonderful discussion. We are about fifteen minutes over. Uh, uh, Nat Nathalie, will you you will clarify? This has all been recorded, so people like me who've just gotten a hell of a wonderful education because my education in forestry really stopped in the late nineties. Um, uh, Ken Ken remembers seeing me some, uh, and Francis too. Um, can Can you clarify that, Nat Nathalie? And and then after that, if anybody else has a final question or comment, we're the rest of us are still here, I guess. Yes, I want to thank all of the participants. First of all, Doug, Bob, Aaron, uh, Francis, um, David, Kat. Thank you very much for coming. This is this has been recorded. Where I'm going to upload it as a blog onto the Pacific Greens website and our Facebook. Feel free to share. Um, I am also going to share. I'm going to share with my comments. Um, and let's continue working together and engaging more people in this conversation. I think that we tend to all agree. There is, I think that very few people disagree with us when we, we all have needs. So, um, I, I can I throw something in as Please. a last shot? Mm -hmm. um, I really advocate biochar as the uh, pre Columbian Indians did it. And the way they did it is they dig a trench. We can get backhoes to do that. And I'd love to see schools all over Oregon uh, try that and through that uh, purify their uh, uh, waste stream so you're not poisoning your own kids, but also in the forest, just dig a trench. Don't you don't build a kiln, dig a trench like they did and uh, uh, bury it 
and learn how the 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 style of burying those uh, slash piles that you then burn with soil over them, I think could be, I don't see why that isn't done everywhere. Thank you. So I also want to encourage people to send me their contact information and any other additional links or things that you would like to post onto that blog. Um, and uh, the community, um, Oregon Community Rights Network is meeting tomorrow about local um, governance, an amendment for local governance, and they're up, and we put the link also to uh, Tax Fairness Oregon. So, and I want to encourage people to contact the governor to request for a legislative session to deal with the crisis, for an emergency le legislative session to deal with the crisis. Um, does anybody want to share any initiative or any event or anything in particular that you would like to have published? Yeah, I'd like to share something. Mm -hmm. I wonder if um, there could be value in um, the, the, you know, environmental community asking the state of Oregon, the, the governor, to ask the, you know, to prosecute a lawsuit, a tort claim against the big oil. Now, uh, the state of Rhode Island has already initiated something like this. And um, so the, the theory would be that uh, some litigation from the state of Oregon against for the global warming that's born, that's now burning up these forests would simply put a, a form of political pressure and uh, litigation is widely used in all the things we heard about today. So I'm just putting out, maybe this is uh, uh, something to ask the governor to do, to sue uh, tort claim on behalf of Oregonians um, for a global warming problem. And then whatever we, whatever comes from the, it's political theater, but. Governor so and the attorney general. Yeah. Okay. Food for thought. I'm going to put my, my email address and my phone number in the chat. So if anybody wants to contact anybody else, feel free and I'll, I'll oblige. Okay, well, this has been really very um, educational. We're, we're encouraging people to contact the land board and say, express their opinions. Anybody else? Uh, Nathalie, I wanna thank you for putting this together and getting this uh, coordinated. George, George did all of the heavy lifting here. Well, I, I mean, for the whole event. Uh, and George knows that he did a tremendous job on this last section, but I, I really want to thank you for putting this together and, and keeping at it. Thank you. And Ken Adams, I want to second that. Nathalie, you did a hell of a job, and I know you put in a lot of hours on this. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Yeah, I'll second that, too. Well, but amongst friends, I want to run or actually identify a candidate to run for Bureau of Labor and Industry because the health of farm workers is very dear to me and in my community. Uh, so, and, and I, as a naturopathic doctor, I have a lot to say about environmental exposure and health, uh, spraying and health and all of that. So that's, those are my plans, the two year plan. Good. I guess we're pretty much done. Thank you, everybody. Okay, bye bye. Thank you. Bye. We'll see you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks so much, organizers. Oh, thank yes. you. I'm just trying to download, save the files.